Okay, everybody, we are going to pick back up with catecholamines and uh, sympathomimetic medications. Catecholamines, know what a catecholamine is? It stimulates the receptor sites in the sympathetic nervous system. Um, it contains a group of monoamines and catecholes that uh, they're an oxidizing group. They're rapidly metabolized and they have a brief, uh, very brief uh, reaction. So like one of the things we use a catecholamine for, one of those is succicolamine. Succicolamine are, um, is a medication that we give a patient right before we intubate them. Um, it helps uh, do several things, drop secretions, does a few other things, but that succicolamine that we give them, we give it because it has a really quick acting, um, very quick acting response. Um, they also, uh, uh, sympathomimetics are synthetic chemicals that, min that mimic catecholamines. So catecholamines um, actively affect and they're more natural. Sympathomimetics are things like um, amphetamines, albuterol, uh, cocaine, different things like that. Um, and they have a longer duration. They last a little longer. Um, succicoline lasts about 10 minutes uh, max and albuterol and um, amphetamines when we give them. So why would we give an amphetamine to someone? Amphetamines are what we give ADHD patients or ADD patients because of the way that their chemical makeup in their brain is. Instead of how caffeine and stimulants speed us up, someone with ADHD or ADD, it slows them down. And so it actually has a... A reverse effect than what you would expect and like I said those are particular those are synthetic um, catecholamines and they are used for things like um, antihistamines they're used um, um, like Sudafed has pseudoephedrine in it um, it has then like I said um, ADHD medications like Adderall Ritalin they're in amphetamine or in the amphetamine group albuterol it uh, relaxes the respiratory system or the bronchus um, from bronchospasms. It relaxes um, the muscles in the bronchus so that uh, breathing becomes easier. Um, another medication is epinephrine or adrenaline. Things we, we can give that IV interosseous. We can give it IM or sub-Q. Um, we can give it in an ET tube. We can give it in a nebulizer. Uh, it affects beta 1. It, it stimulates alpha, beta, and both beta receptor sites. Um, it, ha it increases the cardiac workload and um, the oxygen level, that oxygen that goes to the heart. So why would we give someone epinephrine? Uh, one of the main reasons we give epinephrine is for an allergic reaction um, because of how it affects the cardiovascular system and how it affects the respiratory system. We also give it in the instance that someone is having a, a cardiac arrest. Um, during a cardiac arrest, we oftentimes need to give some kind of epinephrine if it's significant enough so that we can increase the workload. We can make the heart work better. We can send more oxygen to that heart so that it functions and gets oxygen to the rest of the body. So epinephrine is another cardiovascular agent um, that's also used for allergic reactions. Vasopressin. Uh, vasopressin is a very, um, it's a very, um, it's a very good drug that's used for so several things. It's used for cardiac arrest. We give vasopressin during a cardiac arrest. We give it when someone goes into shock, um, whether that's due to bleeding or trauma or whatever that's due to. We give it for diabetes insipidus. So that's different than diabetes mellitus that you're used to. Um, I want you guys to look up diabetes insipidus. And also used to treat uh, GI bleeds. It can be, uh, it, it is, it falls under the catecholamine um, category. Um, <clears throat> but if it's given with other catecholamines, so if we give it with succicoline and then we were to give vasopressin, it makes the catecholamine not work right. So if there's an interaction, there's a, there's a contraindication, especially when treating shock that we wouldn't give succicoline along with vasopressin. Remember that we do not give succicoline with vasopressin.
Um, other vasodilators that um, the reasons that we use them, we use direct vasodilators for hypertension. So that makes the and what a vasodilator does is it makes the blood vessels larger by relaxing the amount, uh, relaxing the vessel walls, therefore decreasing the pressure that's needed for blood to, to go through those vessels. So what a vasodilator does, remember this, what a vasodilator does is it dilates the blood vessels, relaxing that vessel wall and allowing blood to flow through the vessels with less pressure. That means the heart doesn't have to work as hard to push blood through. And we give those medications, vasodilators, we give them for hypertension, we give them for CHF, we give them for heart attack and post-heart attack. We give them for cardiac ischemia. That just means that there's not getting, a, the heart's not getting enough oxygen to it or cardiogenic shock. And that's when the heart muscle itself, um, the heart itself is going into shock. So cardiogenic shock is when the heart itself is going into shock. Um, some of the vasodilators that we give, did I flip too far? Okay, so some of the vasodilators that we give and one that we give most often, especially in the emergency room or in emergency situations or in the clinic situation when someone complains of chest pain, we will have nitroglycerin, nitrostat, nitrobid. Um, it'll be a small tablet, that very, very tiny tablet that goes under the tongue and, and it dissolves over a five minute period. Or it could be in a spray form that we make, we'll push, uh, we have one spray that goes under the tongue. Um, it's in a bottle, the nitroglycerin bottle that we see for, that we usually have in a, in a, a readily available in the clinic is in a bottle, probably about an inch tall. And there'll be about 50 pills in that little tiny bottle. And it's only about half full. Um, remember that once you open that that medic, that particular bottle, you need to date it because it's only good for six months and then we have to throw it away. Used or unused, we have to get rid of it. Um, our, the normal dose for sublingual um, spray or a tablet is 0 0.4 milligrams. And you can give one every five minutes for times three. And usually in a clinic setting, by the time we give the second one, we go ahead and call an ambulance. We tell patients that live more than 20 minutes away from the hospital set from a hospital that when they get take that second one, if it's not starting to relieve about halfway through that second tablet before as they're administering the third, they need to be calling the ambulance or when they administer the second, depending on the patient's condition. Um, so what does it what does it do? It not only does it dilate the blood vessels, gets more oxygen to the heart and can relieve um, chest pain. Now, one of the other things that it does and one of the things we have to monitor closely when we give uh, nitroglycerin is we have to monitor blood pressure because if we dilate the blood vessels, what happens? If we dilate blood vessel, blood pressure goes down. So giving someone a sublingual medication every five minutes for 15 minutes, they may be 180 over 90, but by the time they take that, that sec three minutes into that second pill, they may be 90 over 50. And if you give them that third pill, you know, then we're, we're in a situation where it may be too dangerous to do it in a clinic setting and we need to send them on to the emergency room. So be sure that you are monitoring closely that patient's blood pressure. Um, Normally, the normal standard for taking blood pressure when you give someone nitroglycerin is you give, you take the blood pressure prior to, you take it two minutes after, you take it before you, at five minutes before you give the next pill, two minutes again, two, two, two and a half minutes again, five minutes before you give a third pill, um, you need to take it in a 15 minute period. If you have to give three, you're going to take the blood pressure seven times. Uh, in a 15 minute window. So just know that it has to be monitored frequently. Once they get into the emergency room or into ambulance, lots of times they'll give them um, an IV dose, which is five micrograms per minute in adults. Um, it can be increased up to 200 micrograms. Usually they start at three to five micrograms um, IV. And most IV pumps are set up for that especially the new ones. Um, direct vasodilators, once again, um, other things that are can be an issue with that is, is we build up a tolerance to it. 
um, people that have to take it on a regular basis, people that have chest pain regularly. Maybe they have ischemic heart issues or they have idiopathic uh, angina, which means that there's not a real, we're not real sure why they're having it, but they're having it and they have to take it regularly. Or someone has a condition where they have to take a long acting, which means it's a slow release nitroglycerin pill. That's called MDUR. Um, that's a medication that over time that has to be increased. The dose has to be increased. Um, once again, I talked about how the tablets, they're in a um, light protected bottle. It's in a dark brown bottle. Uh, they need to be protected from light, from air as much as possible, kept airtight. But after, a, after six months, we have to get rid of them because they're not as effective as they used to be. So once again, those are some things that we have to remember about nitroglycerin, especially when we have that in the clinic. And as far as that is concerned, every medication that you open in a clinic setting, whether it's a hormone, a multi-dose vial, or a multi-dose bottle, say you have clonidin, which is a little tiny white pill that's 0 0.1 milligrams, what you have to do is you have to, once you open the bottle, you have to date the day you open it. And your pharmacy or wherever you get that medication from or the monograph will tell you once it's open, it's only good for so long. Whether it's the expiration date on it or um, like with insulin, insulin that's kept in the refrigerator in a clinic setting, we can keep that in the refrigerator for 30 days. After 30 days from the date that it's open, we have to throw it away. Um, Hormone, hormone medications, we have to date the bottle because they're only good for what at different hormones, different companies have a different window. But once something, a medication expires, we have to get rid of it. We have to put it in the biohazard container. We have to get rid of it because if you get audited or you get a safety survey and you have medication in the clinic, whether it's in the sample closet or it's in the refrigerator, um, or it's in a, a cabinet, no matter where it's at, it has to be disposed of when it exceeds its ex expiration date. Or not only will they, they'll write you up and find your clinic. So you have to be real mindful of expiration dates. Um, so uh, niperidine is another vas vasodilator generally given IV. Um, and it's for to increase cardiac output, also there to um, decrease blood pressure and it helps to maintain that, that um, blood pressure. Hydralazine. Hydralazine is given very often to people who have difficulty um, maintaining a blood pressure. You will see often, very often, especially with our patients who are much older, that they'll be on multiple medications to control their blood pressure, especially if they have kidney issues or something else going on. They'll have hydralazine or clonidin um, one of those two as a extra um, medication to take if their blood pressure do doesn't doesn't stabilize after normal medications. Hydralazine it dilates the arterioles, so not I mean the smaller arteries uh, in the especially in the lower pulmonary and the uh, the systemic vascular uh, system. So once you get out into the arms and the legs, it um, dilates those arterioles, which are smaller, or very small arteries. And in an emergency situation, so if a per patient is home and maybe they are 30 or 45 minutes away from a hospital and their blood pressure, they've taken their morning blood pressure medicine and their normal blood pressure is 150 over 80 in the mornings after an hour after they take all their medicine. Well, this particular day, they take it and they take their blood pressure an hour and a half after they took their medicine and now it's 190 over 110. They could take that hydralazine and then take it and in about 20 minutes, take their blood pressure again and um, they can check their blood pressure and see if it's coming down. If not, they do. you can do the same thing with clonidin. You can give them one to take, check their blood pressure in 30 minutes, if it's 20 minutes or so. If it's not coming down, then they need that ER visit. Uh, diuretics. Diuretics are something that are given for multiple reasons. Um, most people normally think of diuretics to, to treat congestive heart failure, but sometimes it's due to changes in vascular system uh, where people have edema, edema due to volume overload or decreased cardiac um, output where they're not circulating the blood the way they used to. Um, it can also be given to patients with pulmonary edema, 
Um, and it can help preserve kidney function if it's given uh, when it needs to be when it needs to be given and not waiting until someone has a very low kidney function to give that. One of the most common diuretics that's given is furosemide. <clears throat> this will definitely be one of the medications that is on your list. Um, it can be given IV or PO by mouth. Um, it can be given IM, but it just doesn't work very well, to be honest. IM, uh, people don't get a very good um, output. Um, people who are on, um, people who are on dialysis or have issues, uh, with fluid, with, um, with kidney function, really bad kidney function, or they have electrolyte imbalance issues. Maybe they have something called Lewy body syndrome. That's why someone has a sodium imbalance and we're not really sure why. Um, a lot of times you have to be very careful about giving Lasix. Lasix is a, and remember this, Lasix or furosemide is a potassium wasting medication. And when we lose potassium, we lose sodium as well because potassium, sodium, and chloride go hand in hand. They are the electrolytes in our body that are very important for muscular function and for, for action potential to happen for all of our, and just think your heart is a muscle that must uh, have must know to pump. Well, if you lose sodium, potassium, and chloride, your muscular function or your the, act, the ability to have action potential in the body changes. So we have to be very careful if someone has um, an electrolyte imbalance that we give them, make sure that they have a supplement to go along with it. Most patients that are on Lasix over a long, or furosemide over a long period of time will be on a potassium supplement. To, to maintain that, that healthy potassium level. Another thing that happens, if, and remember this, with potassium, um, there's a very small window. Um, it's 4.5 to 5.4 is the window um, of a healthy potassium level. If you get above or below that, um, there's, a very, um, there's a very good chance that someone could have a heart attack. The only way we get rid of an elevated potassium level is with uh, something called KXLate and potassium is disposed of generally through bowel movement, sometimes through uh, through urination, but also through bowel movement. So we give them kx to help them get rid of excessive potassium. If they need potassium, once again, we talked about this earlier when we talked about medications that can be caustic or that can burn a vein. Um, potassium can be given IV, but it has to be given very, very slowly over a very long period of time because it burns and it can change cardiac function. So we have to be very careful. Normal Lasix dose by mouth would be about 20 to 60 milligrams a day. And usually if it's 60 milligrams, it's broken up uh, into two doses or uh, uh, it'll be given first thing in the morning and then around two in the afternoon because it works for about six hours. IV, we can give it anywhere from 20, 10 milligrams all the way up to 100 milligrams. We just give it over about two minutes. Um, a side effect of that is flushing, uh, sometimes when you give it IV. Uh, mannitol is another medication that is a diuretic. Um, and then I'm going to talk about another diuretic that's not listed, that's also commonly seen. Mannitol is generally given for brain injury. It's not really given for anything other than swelling on the brain, someone who has head trauma. Not something you're going to give in the clinic, but you should know what mannitol is just because you should know what it treats. It treats head injuries where there is excessive fluid on the brain. The last diuretic that's not on here, and I'm sorry I did not add it, but that you need to know about is hydrochlorothiazide. Actually, there's two. Hydrochlorothiazide. It is a potassium wasting um, diuretic generally given in combination with a blood pressure medication, a vasodilator, or a, a calcium channel blocker, hydrochlorothiazide, lots of times is given in combination either, either as a combo pill or they'll take one of each to help increase the um, effects of that blood pressure medicine. And also <clears throat> with someone who just has mild dependent edema, um, swelling in just like the lower part of their legs or ankles and feet, it can help that as well. So hydrochlorothiazide is one. And, and you'll have that on your top 200 list. The other one is sprinolactone. Sprinolactone is one of the very few 
potassium sparing, which means we have to be mo we have to monitor the potassium levels here because it actually makes the body hold on to potassium even though it's working as a diuretic to get rid of um, to get rid of excessive fluid. The last one is Bumex. Bumex is also a potassium sparing. So you have potassium wasting and then you have potassium sparing diuretics. Remember that potassium sp wasting diuretics need potassium with them and then you need to be monitored. The potassium chlor and uh, potassium sodium and chloride levels need to be monitored. So remember that um, Lasix or furosemide and hydrochlorothiazide, those are your potassium wasting. And Bumex and um, sprenolactone are your potassium sparing diuretics. So we're, we have to monitor potassium level with all diuretics, but with a potassium sparing, we're going to be looking for the, making sure the potassium level doesn't get too high. With a potassium wasting, we're going to make sure the potassium level does not get too low. Blood products. Now, there's just a few things you need to know about blood products because you're most likely never going to administer a blood product as a medical assistant. But you need to know that every human body has about five liters of blood. Um, that constitutes about seven to seven or eight percent of your body weight. Um, lots of times, blood loss can be due to trauma. It can be due to a GI bleed due to medications that have caused a, caused an ulceration in the abdomen. Um, or due to certain um, illicit drugs that people take, they can cause a change in the amount of blood products that we have in the body. When that happens, we have to find the source of the blood loss. Um, if it's something that we can take care of because it's trauma, we put pressure, send them to the ER, take care of that. If it's a GI bleed or because of some because someone is taking um, a an, a, an illicit drug or um, a street drug, then we need to figure that out as well. Here's an example I just read about in the news this week. There was a gentleman in North Carolina, I think, I may be wrong, but I think in North Carolina, that was making his own sports drink. And he was arrested because four teenage girls bought a two liter bottle of his sports drink and had internal bleeding so they would have had blood loss what was in that medication or what what he had made that out of was lemonade he had put um methamphetamine in it and gasoline the gasoline and the methamphetamine is enough to cause some serious trauma but just know that sometimes things that people take will cause a gi bleed which will cause their blood level to go down they have red blood cell, white blood cell, platelet, and plasma products um, that can be that can be given. Sometimes, uh, if someone we get someone in the clinic and their hemoglobin is less than eight or their platelet level is really low, what we would have to do is write the doctor will write an order for something called a type and a cross. That means they are determining what specific type of blood they are and then they're cross matching that with donated blood so a lot of you probably donate blood when you're um when this, you have school blood drives so that's what they're doing they are cross matching that the only time that doesn't happen is in an emergency situation where someone has to have blood immediately and we don't have time for that type and cross to be given so we give someone o negative blood o negative blood can be given to anybody um, and so ERs and paramedics and places that any place that would need to, in the hospital, they keep so many units of O negative blood on hand in case of a serious trauma where they can go ahead and administer that blood in an emergency while that type and cross where they figure out what type of blood they are and what the best possible um, donor blood that they have can be given. There have been times I've had patients whose blood was so, had specific antigens or different things on it that we had to have blood irradiated at the Red Cross and then they would send that over to us and it would take like 12 hours for us to get blood to administer to that patient. So in the situation where it's a trauma, we don't have 12 hours. Now, if a patient's hemoglobin is five and they're short of breath and their oxygen level is at 60%, um, you know, they're, they're likely to go into shock. We don't have time then. 
So sometimes we have to go ahead and administer that O negative until we can get the, the blood product that our patient needs in. Uh, medication, oh, sorry guys, medications that alter blood performance. So um, blood platelets um, are what we have to help us clot. Um, remember that blood platelets combi combine with other anticoag anticoagulant uh, enzymes that are um, produced in the liver. They help clot the blood. Now, sometimes we, sometimes we get something called a thrombus or a blood clot due to change in activity, due to certain types of disorders. Um, there are certain types of clotting disorders that people have that will put a well, that will cause there to be a blood clot in the umbilical cord. There's a blood clot in the umbilical cord. The baby gets no oxygen, no nutrition, and it dies. So we monitor those kind of things. Sometimes women have to take a blood thinner. Normally it's in the form of heparin, which they have to give themselves a couple shots a day in the abdomen to take care of that. For people who've developed a blood clot due to a surgery, due to activity change, due to for whatever reason, we give them something called warfarin. Warfarin or Coumadin is a medication that literally is was developed from Purina rat poison. Um, it's in a very, very monitored dose, but we have to be very careful about monitoring that, that particular blood thinner. Coumadin or warfarin, we must do a PT, a protime, with an INR, an in international clotting rate. So they do a PT, INR, on all patients who take Coumadin or warfarin to make sure that they're in a therapeutic range. Normally, we should be... For me, who doesn't take any kind of blood thinner other than Advil every now and then, uh, my, I should be between 0 0.1 and 1. Someone who's on Coumadin for a blood clot, theirs is normally between 2 and 3. We keep them in that 2 to 3 window where their blood's thin but not too thin. If someone has a valve replacement, they have to be even higher. They have to be 3 to 4 on that PTI and R window because they have that artificial valve in their heart Lots of times it's made out of plastic, and they got to make sure they don't develop a clot in the heart. Works much faster. Blood sits and, and flows through. So with a PTI, so remember with Coumadin, you must monitor a PTI in R. Anticoagulant medications, once again, they impair the function of the ability for the blood to clot. Um, it enhances the function of, uh, is enhanced by other medications. Like if you're taking Coumadin and you take Advil, um, it can make your blood thinner. If you take Coumadin and you take aspirin, it can make your blood thinner. Um, sometimes patients have to come off of, so you may have a patient that comes in that's having surgery that's been on Coumadin for 10 years, but now they're going to need a hip replacement. We have to switch them over to a different kind of medication that has a, a lower half-life. We do it about a week before surgery. They take something either called heparin or Lovenox. Um, heparin and Lovenox are also two blood thinners that are given by injection. Um, they do not come in a pill form. They're given by injection. And we usually give those for a very short period of time, either after surgery or before surgery for someone who has clotting issues. Because the half-life is very short and the, the bleeding potential decreases. Our, um, when it, it's given that way because the body will utilize it so fast. So some antiplatelet medications, I've already talked to you about aspirin. Um, another one that you'll see, and the only one on here I'm really going to talk about that you're going to see the most often is Plavix. Our, um, Plavix is given very often to people who have had stents, um, who have had heart attacks, or who have had other clotting issues, um, and they give them Plavix to take because what Plavix does, Coumadin actually inhibits the function of the clotting factors in the body. What Plavix does, Plavix makes the red blood cells that would be clumping together to make that blood clot. It makes the outside surface of, surface of them very slick so they don't stick together. So Plavix and Coumadin actually work very different. Um, Fib fib fri oh, can't talk today. Fibrinolytics, those are actually blood, they dissolve clots in the arteries and veins. So fibrinolytics, um, they actually dissolve clots. Now, there's a very tiny window of, uh, of 
time that you can give this or a very tiny window of error for this. It's given milligrams per kilogram because if you give too much, it can make someone actually have a brain bleed or have a GI bleed or have excessive hemorrhaging. So we have to be very careful. We give uh, in the clinic, we will actually, the doctor will often have to order a very, very small do dose of something called Cathflow, which has a fibrinolytic in it. Um, and it's given for, it's given for people who have a PICC line. Maybe they're getting IV antibiotics over a long period of time. Maybe they're going to have short-term chemo or they're, they're going to have to have um, TPN, which is a nutritional supplement IV for or maybe a month or two, they'll get they'll insert a pick line, which is a very long IV that goes in generally in the upper arm and it feeds into the vena cava. Um, sometimes that'll get clotted, so we give a very, very, very small dose of that fibrinolytic, that cath flow, to help open that up. Fibrinolytics are also given in the instance where someone is having a heart attack to break down a clot in the heart. Once again, the dose has to be extremely accurate. Um, that leaves us with just enough to do one more video, one more uh, presentation for tomorrow. So I'm going to stop here. If you guys have any questions or any issues with any of this, please let me know. Remember, this is uh, lecture th three and you have lecture three and four. This will be five and six and you will have a quiz over five and six as well. because You'll have a test over this at the end. Please don't forget that you also have your top 200 drug test on Friday. Thanks, everybody. Have a good